A great rush of air from above knocked Iko to the ground. A shadow blotted out the sun. As the wind subsided, he became aware of a hulking presence in front of him, heavy beyond mere physical mass. Expecting it to be the last thing he ever did, he looked up. The tip of the dragon's nose was about three feet in front of him. Its head and body were covered in jet black scales. Its eyes were the palest gold with a narrow vertical slit in the middle, black as the bottom of the ocean, seeming deep enough to contain worlds. The dragon shifted its weight slightly and its nostrils dilated. Air moved past Iko as it breathed in. This was it then. How long might it be before someone noticed he was missing? If they came up here to look for him, would they work out the meaning of the blackened patch of grass where he now lay? Man thing. The voice reverberated inside his skull. The legends were right. Dragons had no voices like humans, but spoke directly with their minds. What the legends hadn't mentioned was that the dragon's mind speech was incredibly loud. Perhaps he should move further away? Given his present circumstances, that might not be a wise move. Crawling, said the dragon, groveling as befits your kind. Were you another dragon, I should kill you for this insult. Yet one such as you is scarcely worth that trouble. The dragon paused and breathed out. Iko's head reeled as if from blows. The ground seemed to spin underneath him. Still, he had survived a lot longer than he had expected to after the dragon's arrival. At the moment, he wasn't sure whether that was a good thing. Carefully and distinctly, he framed words in his mind. Oh, great dragon, he said. I offer my most humble apologies for disturbing you. It speaks. The dragon seemed quite startled. His pupils widened fractionally. Iko hadn't been sure his mind speech would work, so that was a relief. Would the dragon hear everything he thought? No, his sources said that you had to want your thoughts to be audible. Oh, great dragon, Iko said. I have made some study of the ways of your kind, but there is, of course, much of which I am still ignorant. I assure you that I mean no offence. I would be most grateful to learn the correct manner of addressing you. Polite, too. There was an uncomfortable pause. He imagined that the dragons had never had to consider such a question, at least not when it was being asked by a human. Oh, great dragon, will suffice, it said eventually. Perhaps, oh, great dragon, you wish to know why I summoned you here. You did not summon me, said the dragon, and Iko sensed anger behind the words. I chose to come. As you wish, oh, great dragon. Iko bowed his head. Look at me, said the dragon, and Iko complied. He knew that he couldn't have disobeyed. I am nevertheless curious to know why a man-thing happens to be on this hilltop, far from its own kind, at the very same moment that I choose to visit it. That is quite simple to explain, O great dragon. I wish to propose an alliance. An alliance? To what end? O oh, great dragon, a fleet of pirates are preying on the people of the Lenis Islands, attacking our settlements and ships. We are a peaceful people, not used to fighting. And you wish me to destroy these pirates for you, said the dragon. Yes, remembering his manners, he added. Please. You would have me burn their ships with my fiery breath, capsize them with a sweep of my tail, pluck man-things from the sea and carry them aloft, shrieking before I flip them into my mouth to crush them and swallow them whole. He winced at the dragon's suggestions. I had thought, O oh great dragon, that the mere sight of you would terrify them into leaving us alone. Perhaps. And what do you offer me in return for ridding you of these vermin? The pirates have a great hoard of treasure on their ships and in their home port. Gold, silver, precious jewels. If you defeat them, it is yours. The dragon did not reply. The corner of its mouth lifted, revealing glistening white teeth. Its nostrils narrowed, and a sound like a tree falling filled Iko's mind. You know far more of our ways than I would have expected of any man-thing, but there is much of which you are ignorant. A gale rushed past him, pelting him with dust and twigs. By the time he could see again, the dragon was no more than a spot in the sky, an odd-shaped bird spiralling upwards. Almost at the limit of sight, there was a violet flash, and the dragon was gone. Suspense.
Right, so welcome to an intimate evening. <laughs> Lovely, intimate, intimate evening, very nice. Button. So, quick agenda for what, what I'm supposed to be talking about today, <laughs> tonight. I don't expect you to read all of that. Um, a disclaimer. Uh, writing is a, an art and a craft, and so necessarily is very subjective. So anything I say that sounds like advice or a warning, you should imagine that I'm prefixing it with, this is what works or doesn't work for me. Yeah. So a little bit about me. You might wonder why, why I've got the J in my name. It's, it's very important if you're trying to Google me, because if you omit it, I know some people have already seen this. Well, this is what happens. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yes, you get that guy out of the League of Gentlemen, Gentlemen. and the oh, inside oh, number nine. Our yeah. village. It's our village. So a little bit more about me. So when, when I was born, my dad was a librarian, mum was a teacher. So there were always books around the house. It was probably inevitable that I would grow up loving books. Uh, I remember dad coming home across the field, the, the the garden outside, we lived in a block of flats, and I'd call out the window, Have you brought anything for me? <laughs> <laughs> and he usually had. Right? Where, where were you? What part of the world? Uh, this was in New Zealand. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I lived there for uh, about eight years when I was a boy. Oh, wow. uh, you know, so the, the poster says I've been writing for as long as I can remember, which is not quite true, but I made my first attempt at writing a story because I wanted to or because I thought it would be a good idea rather than because a teacher said so when I was about eight or nine. And I've been writing on and off ever since. Uh, I gradually came to realise that of the things I do for fun, writing was the thing I was best at and the thing I enjoyed the most. So I thought if there's a possibility of making money from a hobby, writing is probably the one that's going to get the, the most likely to get that result. So around about 2001, I started taking it seriously to say, yes, I'm going to write something that I think is good enough to be published and try to get it published. I eventually self-published my first novel in 2011. That was Death and Magic, which I'll be reading from later. In the 13 years since then, uh, I've published 11 books altogether. There's eight <coughs> in three series and three standalone books which at the moment are not in series but never say never mm -hmm. uh, mostly fantasy with the odd bit of science fiction i've got two science fiction books and the day job in software development i mention that because it it kind of informs some of the writing i do i, I do tend to be pedantic and crossing all the i's and dotting all the t's uh, I, I have a, a bad habit of when when I need the characters to make a decision that's important to the plot. I tend to have them consider every possibility and rule out all the ones that I don't want them to take, just to make sure that <laughs> they, they've really thought about it carefully and they're doing what's definitely the right thing. And really, I should just say, they decided to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my critique group have um, we, we have several abbreviations that point out common flaws or problems with, with one another's writing. And when one of us does that kind of thing or goes into a lot of detail, they just throw it in their comments, STCP, which stands for Stephen the Computer Programmer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the first of the series I'm, I'm going to tell you about tonight is the Dragon Rider series. Mm. You heard a bit of the first book. The Accidental Dragon Rider. Uh, there, are, it's a what's known as a secondary world fantasy, which basically just means it's not our world and it's not connected to our world. So it's not our world in the distant past, like the Lord of the Rings is, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, it's not our world with little isolated pockets of magic and mystery, like Harry Potter. It's a completely separate world. Uh, two books so far. I'm working on a prequel, which uh, might be done by the end of the year, might not be. Uh, the books are connected, but you can read them independently of one another. So the 
protagonist of the second book is the daughter of the protagonist of the first book. And there's about 40 years <coughs> passes between the two, so they, they are connected, but you don't have to read the first one to enjoy the second one. Uh, <coughs> the dragon riders of the, the titles are, they're not necessarily people who ride dragons, but they're people who can talk to dragons. Because my dragons, like, like you heard in that, that extract, they, they don't speak aloud. They're basically telepathic. And um, only a few people in, in this world can actually talk to them. Uh, <coughs> most of the time the dragons live in their own world, but uh, they can visit the human's world if they want to. Uh, humans can't go between the two worlds, but mm. dragons can. And the reason that dragons are in their own world don't have very much to do with humans if they can help it, is hundreds of years before the Dragon Rider books are set. Um, one country had them, had dragons as, as slaves. They, they used them as airborne cavalry in their wars. And the dragons eventually realised they were being exploited and they rebelled and escaped. Uh, but it would be boring if they, if they just stayed apart forever. So yeah. the series is basically about humans and dragons working together to, to try and achieve some common goal despite fear and mistrust and in the dragon's case quite a lot of hatred sometimes you, you know, the dragon in that extract wasn't very pleased to, to be uh, disturbed yeah. in the reading now this is from the second book in the series called The Reluctant Dragon Rider <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so how much do I need to tell you to set the scene it's part way through the book so uh, have we got the name of the character yeah so the char character called Tiwan is the protagonist of this book uh, she's the daughter of Aiko who you, you met in the reading I just did there are two dragons in this, this reading They've, one of them's called Athera he's the boss and there's another one called Olahin who is the dragon that Tiwan mostly interacts with and they've come to the humans have come to meet a merchant who has some, some books that they need to carry out the mission that the dragons have for them but the, the merchant is being awkward he wanted, wanted to see the dragons before he would agree to hand over the books <coughs> so they've Tiwan and Aiko have summoned a, a dragon and two of them have turned up mm -hmm. so uh, this is this is what happens after that Olahin walked up to the scarp and raised her head to look at Tiwan Tiwan met the dragon's gaze trying not to let her attention shift to her teeth Athera held back shifting side to side perhaps seeking the best distribution of his weight on three legs why have you invited us here Athera asked. You have not yet known sixteen years. Oh, great dragons, Papa said. We invited you here because this man, he pointed discreetly to Govus, that's the merchant, has documents that we need to complete our mission for you. He refused to give them to us unless we proved you were real, Olahin said. You should have told him that we would kill him unless we did what you wanted. He did. That's not how dragons do things, Papa replied. In the time of the riders, it was your preferred negotiation strategy, said Athera. That was a long time ago, said Papa. Help me up, Gova said to his servants. If the only reason for coming here was to convince a sceptic of our existence, said Olahin, we can leave now, yes? She began to turn towards the cliff edge, a lumbering movement that seemed to require a lot of planning. Stop, said Gova. He hobbled towards Ollie. Sir, come back here, please, said Papa. Govis ignored him. Will this one be tasty, do you think? said Ollie, halting her turn. Before Tiwan could protest, Athera replied, It is an old one, so he's likely to be tough and stringy. Besides, it appears to be sick. Sir, they're talking about eating you, said Papa. I think they're more intelligent than that, said Govis. He came to Olahin, who stretched out her neck and sniffed at him. You are right, Olahin said to Athera, old and sick. 
Govis raised his hand and reached out to honour him. Papa said, Sir, I really wouldn't advise that, just as Govis touched the dragon's nose. Olahin jerked her head away and shook it as though trying to hold back a sneeze. How rude, said Ethera. My apologies, O oh great dragons, said Papa. I wanted to be sure it wasn't an illusion, Govis said. He took a couple of paces away from Olahin. He leaned forward and shielded his eyes with a hand, apparently studying the detail of the creature's scales. He straightened, rubbing his back with his other hand. Tell them I've got a job for them, if they're interested. I very much doubt they will be, sir, said Papa. Let them make up their own minds. Ask them how 80 ounces of gold for a couple of days' work sounds. <laughs> Tiwan tried to calculate how many svara that much gold would make, and ran out of numbers. Oh, great dragons, Papa said. The old man wants me to ask you a question. I know it's a rude and stupid question, and I apologise in advance for that. He wants me to offer you 80 ounces of gold in return for two days' work. Olahin partly extended her wings and waggled them up and down. At the same time, she shook her head from side to side. Tiwan remembered Papa telling her that was how dragons laughed. How customs have changed, said Athera. I never thought humans would willingly offer us treasure. I trust, Tycho, that you recall our discussions of the liberation. I do, said Papa. Then you will understand why we refuse this offer. Sincerely meant, though I am certain it is. Papa bowed his head. Thank you, O great dragons. He turned to Govis. They're not interested. What? Govis looked at the dragons momentarily, <clears throat> then stared at Papa. He stumbled with the sudden movement, and a servant rushed forward to steady him. A hundred ounces. I'm sorry, sir. A hundred and twenty. The dragons turned to face the cliff. It's not about the price, sir, Papa said. This... It's just not something they do. I thought dragons had hordes of precious metal and jewels, said Gervis. The servant helped him back to his chair. They do, sir. I've seen one. It was the size of your dining room, and if I'd been brave enough to walk through it, the coins and trinkets would have been up to my ankles, if not my knees. Oh. Farewell, humans, said Athera. We will return when Tiwan has known sixteen years. They ran down the slope, surprisingly fast for something so big, and fell off the edge. Tiwan clapped a hand to her mouth. A moment later, the dragons came back into view, ascending into the distance. Tiwan relaxed. The dragons' voices came faintly to her. That one would have been much easier to persuade to our cause than Iko, Dolayne said. Indeed, Athera replied. But we must work with what fate grants us not with what we wish she had granted us. There were two bright purple flashes and the dragons were gone. A breath of wind passed Tiwan's cheek, or perhaps that was just her imagination. Papa turned to Govis. Well, sir, we've held up our end of the bargain. Govis scowled. In the most uncouth way possible, I haven't been humiliated since... He waved a hand as though chasing away a fly. All the same, I'm a man of my word. To the servants, he said, take me home and fetch the books from my table in my, in my observatory and give them to my guests. Thank you, sir, said Papa, bowing. Govis's servants carried him back to the house with an almost indecent haste. By the time the travellers reached the house and went to their rooms, someone had already left the agreed-upon books on top of the writing desk. Papa leafed through them, a big grin spreading across his face. Let's go before he changes his mind. Very good. Very interesting. Mm. That sound of good names, isn't it? Well, yeah, good I've, I've been writing the names down and I've just put the question, where do you get the names from? Where do the ideas uh, from the names? Because that's actually what it's mm. like. Some of them I just play around with syllables until I get something that I like the sound of. Yeah. For my um, sitting lawyer. Some of them oh, I cheat yeah. and use a name generator. Oh, oh that's that will. Yeah generate names that fit various patterns and I, I, I get very lazy about names if I, if I can't think of a name for something in a few minutes um, I just put in a placeholder which is a letter and a number and I, I do that so that I can be sure of finding them with a search and replace and not accidentally yeah. find replacing something that isn't meant to be replaced right. so for instance if I, if I called somebody Ron 
and I referred to something made of iron. Well, Ron <laughs> is in the start of iron. And there's a couple of humorous stories when, not me, but somebody else um, created, they created a Kindle edition of an old book, a public domain book, and, and there was something at the start where they said this Kindle edition was made by so-and-so. And then they realised they needed to do a version for the Nook, the Barnes and Noble ebook reader, and so they just did a search and replace on Kindle to Nook. So of course it's a fairly old story, so there's a, a sentence where a character nooks a fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the word, yeah. Even better, somebody, someone else converted the um, did a search and replace to convert the American English version of the story to um, to British English. And they, they went and replaced <coughs> pants with trousers. <laughs> so, the so the author then refers to the occu trousers of a building. A <laughs> little <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Don't do that. The power of words. <laughs> yeah. So, first, first slide about um, writing advice. Creativity. So, mm. As in, where do you get your ideas from? So, that first sentence, that quote, was the original inspiration for the Dragon Rider series. And if, if you know your Tolkien, you might recognise it as uh, a riff or a mangling of, I think it's in the Lord of the Rings, do not meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Mm. And back in the last millennium, a, mem a subscriber to a mailing list that I was on had that quote, that crunchy thing, as the signature. Um, on, on our messages and so after I'd seen this a few times I thought you know I could get a story out of that and so over the Christmas break in 1999 I sat down and wrote about 600 words of that first scene that I read up to where Ico says I wish to propose an alliance mm -hmm. and I got stuck there for about 15 years oh, <laughs> And the reason I got stuck was because yeah, one idea generally doesn't make a story, yeah. unless it's a really big idea. And so I didn't know what kind of problem Iko was trying to solve. I didn't know why he thought he needed a dragon to solve it. I didn't know whether the dragon was going to say yes or no. And obviously didn't know why the dragon was going to say yes or no. Mm. And it wasn't until I was writing the next book that I'm going to read from where I happened to mention in passing there's, there's a war going on in the background and one side uses dragons as cavalry, airborne cavalry. That's, that was where, where that idea came in. And I realised, ah, if these dragons in this book are the same as the dragons in this little bit of a book that I'm stuck on, then it all falls into place. Right. The dragons you know, realise that the humans have enslaved them and they decide they don't want to be slaves anymore. And <clears throat> so, yeah, that gives the dragons motivations and, and all their backstory. Mm. Uh, so, I, I believe, having done it for a long time, that creativity and being able to come up with ideas, it's like a muscle in that the more you use it, the stronger it gets and the more yeah. versatile it gets. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, really most of my stories come from lots of different ideas that I've gathered over some time. Not usually 15 years, <laughs> months or a couple of years usually. So I have a, a great big word processor document where I write down anything that I think might be useful in a story. And when I'm bored or when I'm between stories, I read over this or parts of it now because it's about 180 pages um, I haven't got the patience to read the whole thing <coughs> uh, and I just look for connections between different things that I've, that I've written down and I look for I, or I just add comments to something that I've written in the mean uh, you know, a few few months ago or a few years ago and gradually it kind of accretes and composts to the point where I think yeah if I take this and this and this and this yeah, there's enough for a story. Put it together, yeah. Having said that, some of my other stories come quite quickly, um, often from random writing prompts. 
like what Dawn gives us. <laughs> <laughs> the writer's group. Yep. Uh, so there, there's that example of the where I had to write a thriller that ended with the characters climbing down a well to look for frogs. Yeah, <laughs> that was really good. Yeah. That was brilliant. Most, most, of the, most of the random things in there, yeah, they're fair, fairly generic, yeah. You can yeah. easily put them into a, a thriller kind of story, but yeah. what on earth is thrilling about frogs? <laughs> <laughs> thrilling and suspenseful. <laughs> you seem to pick the worst subjects sometimes. Or <laughs> well, you get the worst subjects. Yeah, but, um, but I was aware that of the word frog is not, not just a little amphibian. Mm. So I went off to Wikipedia, typed in frog bracket disambiguation, where it lists all, all the different articles in the wiki that, that are something to do with anything that's called the frog or referred to by that term. And part way down the list it says, NATO reporting name for a type of Russian missile. Um, <laughs> bingo! Yes, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's perfect for a thriller. So that's that's why there's this dirty great big missile in in the well at the holiday camp. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like one. what you, sorry, I like what you you were reading before because because the humans had their little plan to pay lots of money and then the dragons actually had their little plan at the end, didn't they? So it's not worth yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll just oh, yeah. but it's um. Just stay for a bit and see what we can do here. <laughs> Again, everybody's different, but the, yeah. the random prompts that work well for me are where there's not just one thing, but maybe two or three or four things. And in some ways, the less they have in common, the better. Yeah. Uh, because it forces you to, to think laterally well, and creatively yeah. to say, well, how, how could this possibly connect it with, with this? Yeah. And the process of working out how, how it's connected will usually, once you've had a bit of practice at it, will usually uh, fill in the rest of the bits you need to make uh, a complete story. Yeah. Uh, so another series, the Dragon Rider series, I'm going to yeah. read about, is one called The Schemes of Raltarn and Thomas. Yes. And that's set in the same world as Dragon Rider, but hundreds of years before. So this is before the dragons escaped. Uh, as with Dragon Rider, there's two books in it so far. I know I need at least one more to finish the story. The, the, these two are not really independent of one another the way the Dragon Rider books are. Uh, book two starts pretty much straight after book one finishes. Um, one of the distinguishing characteristics of this series, in, in a lot of fantasy series, there there are people who might be called wizards or sorcerers who who can do magic and are really good at it, but there are only a few of them. Whereas in <coughs> in this series, quite a lot of people can do magic, but most people are not <coughs> very good at it. <laughs> and this is partly because. There's also a lot of magical devices left around that were made by an ancient civilization. All of it. And they were built, <laughs> Amazing, built to last. Yeah. So the devices have, been, have survived, but the instruction manuals haven't always. Even better. <laughs> Some, sometimes <laughs> has amusing all. consequences, sometimes has deadly consequences. So the Raltarn and Thomas of the title, they're, they're entrepreneurs. Raltarn is the nephew and Thomas is his uncle. Uh, they're trying to make an honest living, or failing that, any kind of living. <laughs> and book one, the, the Mirrors of Elangir, um, is basically about them. They've found, they've found a device, which looks a bit like this, a uh, magic mirror. And they've figured out that there is another mirror, which, if you press the gems around the, the edge in the right sequence. It acts like a video phone. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Sound. Yeah, yeah. The, another thing that seemed like a good idea at the time, they're made in pairs, so each one of them can only talk to the other one of the pair. You the can't call anyone. Uh, so they, they realise, okay, one of them is, is just a curiosity, but if we had the other one, then we could sell them, sell the pair to either I, well, it's not either or. They they 
if they can find the right buyer, they'd raise enough money to make a, a dowry for, for Raltar and he wants to get married to somebody who's above his station in the world. Uh, they could also, if they sell it to the military, uh, it might help the military to win this ongoing war that's been dragging on for years in this case. Uh, so, spoilers, but one, they find the other mirror. It's a long way away, so it's, that's, why, that's why I wrote a whole book about it. Uh, book one ends pretty much when they've got the mirror, the two mirrors. Uh, book two is about the journey back, but part way through the book two, they learn that the war is over and the other side won. So, what do they do now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a map of part of the world. Found a computer program online that generates random planets. Random <laughs> planets? Wow. Yeah. I love how you just find all these things. <laughs> generated a few hundred of them and I picked one that had the characteristics I wanted. Um, I wanted a one where the ocean was all connected, so you can sail from anywhere in the ocean to anywhere else in the ocean. This is near the start of the book where they've, they've realised maybe this mirror that they've found is valuable. You know, it's narrated by Raltarn, I should say. That's who the first person I is. His fiance's father has just sprung a nasty surprise on him because he, he thinks Basically, Raltar and Thomas are wasting his time. Uh, they're not serious about getting married, uh, and so he wants um, he wants the, a bigger dowry, mm. basically, and has given Raltar and Thomas not very much time to ra raise the money. So he's Raltar is considering what to do with the mirror. By itself, the mirror was an ornament or a piece of art. But what if we had the other one of the pair as well? Two people could communicate at any distance as quickly and easily as if they were in the same room. To get the other mirror, obviously I'd need to know where it was. It could be anywhere in the world, but there might be clues in the picture itself that would help me. I removed the mirror from its leather case and propped it on my chair. I took a deep breath and touched the mirror's rubies in the sequence I'd discovered. Straight away the snowy scene appeared before me. I gasped involuntarily at its brightness and sharp detail. Yindrath, that's um, an antiquary they showed it to and told them a bit about it. Yindrath had said the snow meant it had to be in high latitude. The sun had appeared at the left of the picture, fairly high in the sky, and I took this as meaning the other mirror was west of here. West and south would put it on an island in the Tian Ocean, or perhaps even the continent of Elangir. The latter made more sense, given the mirror's providence. Perhaps in the days when Elangir had an empire, the emperor used these mirrors to stay in touch with the provincial governors. The city looked deserted. Its walls might hide a multitude, but any inhabitants would surely light fires to keep themselves warm, and I saw no smoke. I reached under the bed and pulled out a flat wooden box, disturbing a thick layer of dust as I did so. Mara never cleaned under there. She was their maid. Perhaps she thought the past was better left buried. With a deep breath, I flipped the catches. Inside, my father's navigation instruments shone as brightly as the last time I'd looked at them. That would have been a year or so after Uncle had come home and told me he, told me he was going to be looking after me from now on. Sight blurring, I set the box on the floor and lay on the bed. I thought I was done crying over father. I didn't see him all that often when I was a boy, but when he was at home, he packed in more than other boys' fathers did in the whole time they were there. I still remembered how scared I'd been of the rhinoceros in the old zoological gardens, and how curious I'd been about the bears sweltering under their fur. Then there were the fishing trips upriver, and the jaunts around the bay in Uncle Thomas's rowing boat. Thomas had done his best to raise me, but father's death had dealt me a blow from which I'd never fully recovered. Well, now I just have to do my best. I dried my eyes and lifted the contents of the box onto the table. Among the brass instruments were charts rolled up in leather tubes and a small, thick book. The book contained tables of numbers, tide times for all the ports around Asdenund and most of those around Lewis, a remnant of a simpler time. The charts were mostly of the seas around Asdenund. 
They looked odd, as the water was full of details, depths and currents as far as I could tell, while the land was featureless, except for a few prominent hills and buildings. I found one chart of the known world, which showed the north and east coasts of Irlandia, and only the vaguest sketch of its west and south coasts. Under this was a thin brass plate engraved with a chart of the stars. The largest of the instruments was an astrolabe, used to measure angles, mainly for determining latitude. That required you to measure the height of the sun above the horizon at noon, and it looked as though that time had already passed at the other mirror, so it would have to wait until tomorrow. For longitude, most navigators preferred to use a declinometer, a complex apparatus of pendulums and balances that told you the strength and direction of the local magical field. You already knew your latitude from the astrolabe, so you looked up the field vector in a set of tables, and that gave your longitude to within about a tenth of a degree, roughly six miles, good enough for most work. But unless the mirror was much cleverer than I thought, I wouldn't be able to measure the field through it. Where was Father's declinometer, anyway? I rummaged through the box, not finding it. He had only the one case for the tools of his trade, so why would that one instrument be missing? I might have assumed Uncle had sold it, except that there was no second-hand market in Navigator's instruments. But worrying about that wasn't going to help me find the other mirror. I'd have to use the other method, calculate the differences in local times between the two places. I had at least a few hours to wait before the stars appeared in the other mirror, and so went downstairs to brew some tea. As I sipped it, I tried to estimate what the pair of mirrors might be worth if we sold them. Couriers charged to deliver letters according to weight and distance, but the picture in the mirror had no weight, had no weight and could go halfway around the world as, as easily as down the street. On the other hand, you couldn't send messages wherever you wanted, only between the places where the mirrors happened to be. Perhaps, then, instead of selling the mirrors to a couple of rich or important people, we could keep them and use them to send messages for other people. If we kept one in Saimira and put the other in, say, Dharma, letters could save a nine-day journey by sea, 18 days for a reply to come back. We could then charge based on how long it took the scribes to copy a letter when they read it in the mirror. Even better, it would be much more profitable than sending a letter by ship, because we'd be paying only for two scribes, not the ship and its crew. I had no idea how many letters crossed the Sea of Malkara every day, but given that it cost us far and a half to send one, there was a lot of money to be made if we could do it faster. Of course, before we could start making money, I had to find the other mirror. I drank another two cups and headed back upstairs to watch for sunset. Waiting made the time pass more slowly. I thought of Shanu, his fiancée. Her smile, her laughter, her soft voice, and wondered whether our first child would be a boy or a girl. A boy would be better for carrying on the family business, but she'd want to name him after her father, and I wasn't sure I could live with a reminder of that man in my house. Our house. Despite the tea, I dozed off a couple of times, but gradually the sun in the mirror sank towards the horizon, and the sky grew darker. A few stars were visible at the top of the sky, not enough for me to be confident of identifying them. The city showed no lights, reinforcing my belief that it was deserted. I picked up the star chart and gazed out of the window. My room faced roughly east and so was well placed for seeing stars as they rose. The night was relatively clear, so I should see plenty of them. Buildings and hills obscured the horizon, which would delay my sighting of each new star by about ten minutes. I knew a few of the main constellations, and gradually picked them out. There was the tiger, which meant the one below it was the dragon, upside down, defeated, but not dead, never dead. The ancients had better imaginations than me, or perhaps not so much to occupy themselves in the evenings. I wondered if they'd held meetings to discuss what to call the constellations, or if some fellow with nothing better to do had announced one day that he'd divided the stars into groups and come up with names for them. Had they thought he was mad? Or had they argued with him? That group of four isn't a tower, it looks more like a shield. Don't be daft, our shields are round. Rectangular shields won't be invented for another 500 years. It's a crab. <laughs> a crab? That's mad. No madder than any of these other groups. Who ever heard of a tiger defeating a dragon anyway? <coughs> Eventually, the sky in the mirror was dark enough to pick out constellations. 
The first one I recognised was the fuzzy red patch known as the campfire, much lower in the sky than I'd ever seen it. Father had mentioned that as you moved north or south, the stars shifted in the opposite direction, to the point where some disappeared under one horizon and new ones came in at the other. I picked out the tiger at the edge of the picture and now realised that I couldn't see the horizon in any direction. I wasn't even sure which way the other mirror was facing, though it must be more south than north and more east than west, otherwise I wouldn't see any familiar constellations. I'd have to wait for the dragon to rise over there and make a guess as to how high it was here. Better than that, I could use Father's astrolabe to measure the height of the dragon here. I struggled with the instrument's bulk to align it with where I'd guessed the horizon was, and then tilted the cross piece to sight on the lowest star in the dragon. How would Father control this monstrosity? It seemed to require three hands. The best I could manage was that the star was now between 70 and 80 degrees above the horizon, meaning that the other mirror was between five and 6,000 miles west of here. I laid the astrolabe on the bed, rubbing my arms to ease some of the fatigue. I could scarcely contemplate such a distance, eight times further than from here to Nulis. Even without bad weather or any obstacles to sail around, that was a four-month return trip. If we departed tomorrow, by the time we got back, Shanu would have had to accept another suitor. Wow. <coughs> Very interesting. Did he say she was pregnant? No, no, no. How dare you, sir? <laughs> She's a lady. Pregnant. <coughs> you know, just <laughs> sorry, oh, interval break. Your, um, interval. On your front cover, on the thing with the mirror, do, do, is the markings anything insignificant or are they just random scribblings? <coughs> yes. Random scribblings. <laughs> I think I, I based it off the, I'm not sure if it's the Korean alphabet or the Thai alphabet. Right, course, yeah. And then just jumbled, jumbled them up. Them up yeah, yeah, I like that. I was like, it's, it's got to be yeah. something. <laughs> Definitely. Thank totally, you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's take a break. Yes. Right, so I promised you a time travelling biologist. Yes. So. yes. <laughs> So this is a science fiction story rather than a fantasy story. This is a collection of short stories, um, some of which came, came from random writing prompts and some of which I just had knocking around in my head. So this is the first story oops, in, the, um, in this collection. It's called The Long Way Round. Chattering. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Finally, it is dark and quiet. The last of the chattering animals, with their hideous smooth skin and flat faces, has left this mausoleum. Outside, the white flakes form once more from the sky, swirling and tumbling in the wind, robbing the earth of its warmth. They remind me how far from home I am, but at least they tend to keep the chattering animals in their burrows. I emerge from the underground chamber where the hot cylinders lie. When first I found this place, I thought it might be a hatchery, but I have seen no young ones here. The only chattering animal that comes in here is a small grey one that periodically adds black rocks to fires at one end of the cylinders. I wrap myself in the discarded coverings I found at the back of the chamber, partly as a disguise, but mostly to keep warm on the upper levels. At first I thought they were skins of the chattering animals, but they seem to be woven of plant fibres. That goes some way towards explaining why this species is so numerous in an environment for which it seems so spectacularly unadapted. Most of the coverings are too long for me, and I pull them up over my head, where they drag on my crest and leave my forearms exposed. I will have to choose between cold hands and a cold head. My torch lights the way along passages, up staircases, across echoing galleries. As I draw nearer to the levels above ground, the skeletons become more and more numerous, and I jolt every time the beam of my torch sweeps across one. Most are mounted in boxes of a fine, almost transparent crystal, but a few stand on plinths open to the air, as though waiting to pounce on me. The species I recognise are in unrealistic or impossible poses. Evidently the chattering animals still have much to learn about anatomy. At last I come to my quarry. 
mounted on a wall behind a layer of crystal, the bones of a sleek fish, twice as long as I am high. It has been squashed almost flat and buried in mud that turned to stone over millions of years. The chattering animals have partly exhumed it, leaving it resembling a disturbingly realistic sculpture. Its long snout is crammed with teeth that still look sharp enough to tear flesh. Its eye socket is the size of my fist, suggesting it was adapted for hunting at great depths. But when last I saw this animal, it was on the surface, and it made a considerable nuisance of itself. From my satchel, I take my scanner and slowly pass it over the skeleton. As I had hoped, near the middle, it lights up like the full moon. My ticket home is buried in what remains of this beast's belly. All I have to do now is extract it. I could smash the crystal. Experience has shown it to be brittle, but the shards would pose a hazard to my feet. Fortunately, the crystal is held onto the rest of the case by simple mechanical contrivances. My cutter burns through these in a matter of moments, and I lift the crystal out of the way. By now my hands are numb, and I rub them together to warm them. When my hands have stopped shaking, I check the scanner again to be certain of where my target lies, and set the cutter to maximum power. The stone glows orange, and an acrid smell drifts from it. I was one of the first to volunteer for the Deep Time Corps. Time travel promised to answer so many questions about evolution and geology, perhaps even offer some possibilities about the origin of the moon. Going into the past is simple, at least from the traveller's point of view. Walk through the light of the machine's energised torus and emerge in the same spot nine or ten million years late earlier. Coming back is harder as there is no machine in those prehistoric jungles. So each traveller carries a homing device, keyed to her biosignature, so that the machine that the machine could use to reach through time and pull her back to the present. I was on a little boat, deploying sensors to monitor currents, temperature, and concentrations of various biomarkers. A freak wave nearly capsized the boat. When I recovered, I saw my homing device in the water a few meters away. I thanked the sun that the designer had made it float. Before I could steer the boat to retrieve it, a huge fish, the fish whose skeleton now hangs before me, emerged from the ocean and swallowed it. I discharged my weapon at the fish, but of course it had already submerged, and all I achieved was to produce a cloud of steam. I screamed, cursing that day, and the day I stepped through the time machine, and the day I first went to a zoo, and even the day I had hatched. Eventually, my rage spent, I returned to the shore to take stock. I had a year's supply of dried food and water purification tablets. If I could learn how to hunt and avoid injury or predation, I might live out most of my natural span. It would be a lonely existence with no possibility of rescue. Without the homing signal to lock onto, the probability of the core being able to open a time gate within even a thousand years of my current position was essentially zero. I spent the next few days as far as I could from the sea. In a forest, I found a herd of club-tailed sauropods, a species no doubt thoroughly studied by previous expeditions. Many smaller animals darted among their pillar-like feet, snuffling for food in the churned up ground. One species caught my attention, a plump brown thing no bigger than my thumb. It would climb the stems of plants and hold on with a thin, flexible tail. It was mostly nocturnal, and for this reason it took me some time to notice that it was covered in a substance like very fine grass. I had never seen anything like this, and tried to get a closer look. Of course, these animals were very shy, and ran off as soon as I neared them. I headed back to my camp to pick up some camera traps. Halfway there, I was surrounded by blinding white light. Startled, I lost my footing and fell to the ground. I felt as though I was being stretched, then compressed, then turned inside out. Before I could scream, the sensations and the light had gone. I lay in darkness on a cold, hard surface. I had just been dragged through a time gate. How was that possible? My homing device was in the belly of a fish hundreds of kilometres away. Conceivably, it might have activated, but then the deep time core would have recovered a surprised and angry fish, not me. As I explored this strange, frigid mausoleum and saw skeleton after skeleton, I worked out what must have happened. The fish had died and been fossilised. 
thousands or millions of years later, the chattering animals dug the fossil up with the homing device still inside it. The process of mounting it on the wall must have activated the device. As the device is keyed to my biosignature, it must have opened a gate between itself and me. I had thought that impossible, but time travel is still a new technology, not yet fully understood. Over the next few days, I devised a plan to retrieve my homing device. The fact that the chattering animals leave the mausoleum at night would make it much easier to execute. I found places where they keep food, in surprising quantities considering that none of them live here. It is tasteless stuff, with hardly any texture, worse even than what the deep time core expects me to live on, but it stills the gnawing ache in my belly. I finish cutting my way around the homing device and pull out the chunk of rock that encases it. I roll the rock around in my hands, savouring the warmth that the cutter imparted to it. When it has cooled, I study it with the torch, seeking the best points to tap it with my hammer. I place it on the floor and crouch before it, trying to let as little of my body as possible touch the cold surface. I tap the rock, and it comes apart quickly and neatly, revealing my homing device. It is discoloured from the fish's digestive juices, and the bottom has been crushed, but it is still recognisable. A thick cylinder about the length of my hand, with the top end tapered. A green light pulses near the top, the recall active indicator. All I have to do is press the top, and the machine at the deep time core will lock onto the homing signal and open a time gate around it. A beam of orange light falls across me. One of the chattering animals stands in a doorway. It carries a primitive torch, something burning inside a box of crystal, and its coverings against the cold are bulky. It has not yet seen me. The plinth of another skeleton hides me for now. It makes noises, perhaps having noticed the damage I did to the fish. Of course, I cannot understand its calls, but I sense fear. I should leave now. How long will the time machine take to knock onto the signal? I have no way of knowing. I press the top of the homing device. It beeps. The chattering animal calls again and advances towards my position. I bow my head and clasp the homing device to my chest. I will not lose it again. The animal catches sight of me and screams. I must appear as hideous to it as it does to me. My crest rises, a useless reflex that evolution has not yet bothered to cull. The animal brandishes a smooth club the length of its forearm. Ancient aggression stirs within me, urging me to slash this puny animal's throat or belly and feast on its warm flesh. It has been far too long since I surrendered to my primal instincts. I begin to stand, claws outstretched. The honing device clatters on the floor. Both the animal and I glance at it. It chooses that moment to open a time gate. The next thing I am aware of is waking up in a hospital. My supervisor from the deep time core comes to visit me. I have been unconscious for five days. Three journeys through time in less than a month have taken their toll on my body, but the doctors are pleased with my progress. The chattering animal was pulled through the time gate with me. He, I am surprised to learn the animal is male, was injured but is recovering well. <laughs> Evidently they are tougher than they look. My suspicions that their chattering is a language has proven correct. Linguists from the university are already able to hold a simple conversation with him. I explain how I lost my homing device and how it found me again. Its log file indicates that it was buried for 75 million years, 65 million from now, before the mechanical shock of the chattering animals excavating the fish reactivated it. Perhaps I should stop calling them animals, so it is obvious that they are much more than that. The world in that far off time is much colder than it is now. This is why the chatterers cover their bodies and burn rocks to heat them at their buildings. My head spins with the possibilities of what we might learn from them. Oh. Possibilities of what we might learn from them and they from us. My supervisor says that a general has already asked her whether we might be able to make the future world warm enough to live in. Apparently some of the fringe theories I have heard about an imminent global catastrophe are not entirely without foundation. Yeah, so coming, coming back to the... Yeah. I mentioned this kind of that from a random... Yeah, yeah. 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 Do, do you do them on all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's a bit of a skin.
obviously. But, um, <laughs> no, well, they're all standalone stories. Sorry. Uh, so the prompt for this was any any time in the past. It was supposed to be a comedy. And I quickly gave up on that idea because comedy is hard. <coughs> and the things it had to feature were a blizzard. I've got the blizzard in at the start. Yeah. That's what keeps the animals away from the, the museum. Uh, a scary fish. Yeah. And a message in a bottle. Okay. <laughs> and I forget exactly how how the creative process went, but you might have guessed the the, the mausoleum is actually the Natural History Museum in London. Yeah. Um, it's probably meant to be nine, late 19th, early 20th century because the guard is using a, a torch with a, with a candle in it or a burning wick rather than, ele rather than ele an electric torch and that, that just kind of seemed to fit better with, the, with the, the feeling of the story and so once I'd decided that the fish was going to be um, a skeleton rather than a living fish that, that kind of set me thinking about time travel and um, uh, the message in the bottle could have been, you know, what if it's something inside the fish? So that, mm. that set me thinking about time travel as well. And so anybody who was intelligent enough to be able to research, you know, other other creatures and do time travel would have had to be a reptile back then, a dinosaur, yeah. rather than a human. Mm. So I hope it was. You figured out towards the end that the, the chattering animals are actually humans. Mm. You swapped it round, didn't you? Yeah, with hideous smooth skin, no scales, yeah. no flat, yeah. flat faces, and they don't have snouts with lots of teeth in. Clever. I love it. Clever, mm -hmm. yeah. Because she was hatched, wasn't she? You said it. She oh, yes, and most, most of them are female, because yeah. most, most reptile species, the, the females do, other than the dominant ones. The female and the species <laughs> when, when did you do your sci-fi? <laughs> what year did you write that? Oh, 2019, 2020. Mm. I forget exactly when. I've, I've got quite detailed records, but I don't bother remembering yeah, any of this cool. stuff because the computer remembers it all it for stalls me. It <laughs> Really? So... <coughs> plotting, plotting. Plotting and planning such as it is, and I say that because I, I don't really do a lot of planning nowadays or plotting. I, um, <coughs> there is a hypothesis, I should call it in scientific terms, and I mean, you know, there's probably enough of it to call it a theory now, uh, that pretty much all well-known successful stories in the, the Western literary tradition essentially follow the same structure if you look deep enough uh, and this structure goes by several names so there, there's a few of them the hero's journey is one you may have heard of um, it's also known as the three act structure which might loosely be called beginning middle and end yeah. uh, it's also known as the five point or the seven point story structure based on each of those points is a, a key moment in the story where you raise the stakes or one of the main characters has to make a decision that they can't undo so mm. there's no no turning back after that point and it's it's sometimes called five points sometimes called seven point depending on how important you think the different points are and how how rigid you want to be uh, there there is quite a lot of flexibility in this this structure uh, but most of the plotting and planning that i do when, when I start to write, before I, I sit down to write, is more like brainstorming and asking what if. Mm. So, <clears throat> so the planning that I do when, when I do it is, I, I tend to do a bit, I, I plan enough to write a few chapters of the book and then I write the chapters and I get to the end of where I've planned and then I need to plan a bit more and so I plan a bit more and I write a bit more I keep doing that until I get to the end of the book and I reach a point where I think it would be good to say that's the end uh, I, I liken it a bit to a, a road trip taking a road trip across a, a big country where you might decide you know, I want to start at this side and one city on this side and 
finish up in a city on the other side of the country and maybe I'll go through this city and this city uh, but, and I'll, I'll plan, but I'll only plan how I'm going to get from here to here uh, because I don't know what's, what's in here. I might see some, when I get to here I might yeah. pick up a leaflet in the hotel and say, oh, I didn't know there was one of those around here. Oh, that's interesting. I'll, I'll go and take a look at that, rather than going straight on to the next city. So that's pretty much the approach I take. Is planning the long bit and then writing yeah. is quite quick once you've done the planning. <laughs> is that simplistic? <laughs> yeah, can can be. I. I don't do as much planning for the stories nowadays as I, I used to uh, because I find, I'd find I'd, I would do a lot of planning that ended up not being used mm. and I, I don't like ending up doing that. Mm. Uh, so yeah, uh, so one, one thing, one other thing to mention here, um, write what you know, mm. which is a piece of advice that's often given out to people who say, oh, I'd love to write, but I don't know what I, what I ought to write. Well, write what you know. Okay. And like, like a lot of writing advice, it's, um, it's over, over dogmatized, if that's a word. Um, and the way, the way I look at it is, it doesn't mean write only what you know, because yeah. if that was what it meant, there would be no historical fiction, living yeah. memory. There would be no fantasy and science fiction. Um, most romance novels would not be anywhere near as romantic as they are. <laughs> That's very true. The only people who would be able to write murder mysteries would be... Murderers. <laughs> you spoiled the punchline. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> would be people who'd worked as detectives on murder cases, murder cases. or people who'd actually killed someone. Yeah. So what, what I interpret it to mean is use your skills, your experience, your memories, you know, whatever it is that makes you, you, to inform what you write and to make it more believable and more authentic. But don't just, don't stick only to that. Mm. And Could I ask you a question? Yes. Any of the characters in your book then based, is there any parts of their personalities that are based on people you know? There is one character in a book that I'm not reading from tonight, Escape Velocity, who is based on a guy I used to work with who I had a fairly low opinion of. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a vague portrait that he would yeah. probably never would know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the advice of my lawyer, I am not going to So the, the next, next book I'm going to read from, um, Death and Magic, the protagonist of that is a 17-year-old female apprentice wizard who wants to be a healer but ends up having to investigate lots of murders and you won't be surprised to learn that I have never been female. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have never been a wizard. <laughs> I don't think that's debatable. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> the only healing I've done um, has been to stick a band-aid on somebody. <laughs> and I certainly haven't investigated any murders or caught any murderers either. <laughs> But what she also does is she, at the start of the story, she gets bundled off to a new school to finish her apprenticeship where she doesn't know anybody and she falls in love with one of the other apprentices. So I haven't, I haven't done any of the things I mentioned, but I have been 17. Yeah. <laughs> I have had to start at a new school where I didn't know anybody or hardly anybody yeah. and I fell in love with somebody at the school. Oh, yeah. One of the other pupils, I yeah. hasten to add. Yeah. So I used what I remembered of that, because it was like 20 years before, uh, to make those scenes, I hope, more believable, more authentic. And I hope that the believability and authenticity of those will carry over into the other scenes where I'm just completely making it up. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's... This 
first book of it. Four books, isn't there? There's four books in this. It's another fantasy series. It's in a separate world from the other two series that I've mentioned. Uh, this one is complete, so uh, no waiting for the next next installment. Um, tagline that I came up with is magic, murder, ancient gods, and a little romance. Mm -hmm. so in parts of the book, some of the books, it's more than a little. So, you know, I've already said a bit of this about who the main character is. Um, as well as having to investigate various gruesome murders that have been committed by magic, which is supposed to be impossible. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of the series, she gets caught up in the plans of an evil god. And this evil god basically wants to rule the world and enslave everybody because that's what evil gods do in fantasy fiction. Well, yeah. they do. And to even the odds a little bit, she has this immortal being in her head who is opposed to the evil god and guides and protects the protagonist. But because the immortal is seeing the bigger picture, she doesn't always act in the, the best interests of the protagonist. Mm -hmm. And I realised as I was getting ready for this talk that the chapter I picked out has almost none of that. <laughs> I picked pick one know. That, would, that would fit into the amount of time. Oh, that so, and this also isn't in the reading that I'm going to do, but anyway, that is a map of the school where most of the story happens. Wow. Uh, so to make, to, to create that picture, I actually made a model of the, the school in the computer and then told the computer to do a, a bird's eye view of it uh, and just drew what I saw, just for reference, so you can compare That's how it started. finished finished article to the, the original map. Mm. That's my working map. Uh, yeah, a little bit more about uh, the way I write. Mm. Uh, this this slide says drafting, as in first draft, yeah. as in getting the words yeah. down on the page, to just to con contrast it with writing, which is the overall the whole process. So if you're writing short stories or poems, then you can probably be inspired for the whole time that you're working on one um, because they take a couple of hours or a couple of days. Books take months or years and it's not legal to be inspired for that long. <laughs> <laughs> so most of what actually makes make sure that you finish what you what you started in when, if you're writing a book is self-discipline and determination and a lot of that is just habits, mm -hmm. really. So I try to write something every day, even if it's only a sentence. And there, there have been days when it has been only a sentence. Um, if you if you can't write every day, um, at least try to stick to a schedule, like say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or. Mm -hmm all day Saturday or all day Sunday, or don't go more than a couple of days without uh, writing something. Mm -hmm. And that has two advantages. One, you know, making regular progress, steady progress towards the overall goal. And it also means that whatever you're working on stays near the front of your mind. So you're thinking about it when you're not actually sitting down writing mm. so that when you do sit down to write you have some idea of what you're going to say rather than having to rather than staring at a blank page for half an hour and <coughs> giving up in disgust or thinking now where where was I? I've got to got to read the last fifty pages that I wrote. <coughs> oh wow this is rubbish. I need to rewrite this. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you do that, that you'll yeah. just end up never finishing. Yeah. So Targets can help, like I'm going to write so many words a day, or so many pages a day, or per week, or per session, but until you've got somebody actually willing to pay to read your writing, mm. it's not, not worth beating yourself up about missing targets. Cool. If you find you're missing targets a lot, then they're probably unrealistic, so scale them back down, 
and then when when you can hit them regularly then maybe make them a bit more demanding and there are some people who can bang out the flawless first draft I'm certainly not one of them so don't worry too much about getting everything exactly right first time it's it's much easier to write something that's approximately right and then refine it so that it's as good as you can make it than it is to write something that's perfect the first time if you're in the middle of, of writing something try try not to let anything interrupt your flow if you if you're not sure of what what needs to come next yeah. because say you want to write something that make sure you're not contradicting something you wrote earlier or say the characters are going from one place to another and you're not sure how long it will take uh, just leave yourself a note to say okay I need to check this that I'm not contradicting this thing over here or okay they took however many days make a note to go from A to B <clears throat> or you need them to solve a problem that you've given them in, in a really clever way but you don't know how they're going to solve it mm. okay yeah. just, uh, just leave a note protagonist solves the problem by doing something clever <laughs> and then getting on with the, with the next scene and then of course when, when you come to do your second draft or you read it you, you then get to deal with all those notes mm. but because you're in a, you know, editing is a different kind of mindset from writing to begin with you find it's much easier to deal with, with notes yeah. so kind of on, on that subject the dreaded writer's block um, I, I use that to mean you you either want to write but you don't know what to write or you know what you want to write but you don't know how to say it mm. so I don't get blocked now nearly as often as I used to and I think it's partly because I have this habit of writing it every day yeah. so I'm, I'm thinking about the story when I'm not writing so I've got some idea of what to say and I sit down to write. Um, sometimes, if you if you know what's supposed to happen in a in a later scene, you can skip ahead and write that later scene. And leave yourself a note to say I skipped ahead here. Mm. Uh, and you might find the reason that you were stuck on that scene was that you didn't actually need it, and subconsciously you knew that. And you just yeah, had to, that's interesting. Yeah. Had to work through it and realise. Uh, and sometimes writer's block is your subconscious telling you you made a bad decision earlier on and so it may be useful to to ask could I change one thing in what I've already written that would let me make progress on the part I'm stuck at, stuck on yeah and if the answer is yes then make a note and carry on writing as if you'd already changed it yeah, so there's, there's two reasons for that. One, unless you're very disciplined, if you start editing, <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll start rewriting the whole thing and not making progress towards the end of the story, which mm -hmm. is what you're really trying to do in the first draft, yeah. or should be trying to do. Should be trying to do yeah. And the other one is, is maybe a bit more practical. If you change your mind again about whatever it is, you only have to do one lot of rewriting, not two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So there's there's mention of a, a symbol that's cut into the, the victim's body, and it's that symbol that's on on the, the hand there. Mm. But uh, it's not actually on the in, in in the story. It's not actually on on the victim's hand. It's on the victim's stomach. Oh. Uh, and the reason I, I did it with a hand that's that's actually my hand. Um, I didn't fancy Honest. showing off my, my hairy stomach. <laughs> Good around your belly button. For your arms. For your arms. <laughs> and apart from that, it, I don't think it would have been obvious that it was a stomach. <laughs> that would have been <laughs> no. So I hadn't just emphasised. Yeah. And then this, this became a kind of motif for the theme for the covers of the story. So all, all the other books in this series, they've got a hand on, on the cover. So has the symbol got a name, Steve? Um, not as such, but spoiler, 
However, it, it's the symbol of the evil god that I mentioned. Oh. So, uh, so, the evil oh. god symbol. I guess yeah. like so we <laughs> pick up the story where Ad Adramal, that's the name of the protagonist, um, the, a captain from the City Watch is, has tried to convince her to investigate these, help, help her investigate these murders. And she's, she's just looked at the the body of one of them and she's she's seen this symbol carved into him and she doesn't believe that a wizard did it but she's she's cast a spell that reveals reveals things to her and it 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 shows her that the that the symbol was car carved by a, a wizard rather than by any any other kind of user of magic mm -hmm. uh, and she I guess I guess she's <coughs> fainting because of the way the chapter starts. <laughs> so sounds reached her from a great distance. A man's voice. Adramal, he said, are you all right? Adramal sat up to see Captain Tagarda leaning over her. He looked blurred and she realised she'd been crying. For a moment, only a moment, that hurt more than knowing Marek had been right to suspect her. Tagara held out a hand. This time she accepted it. Without apparent effort, he pulled her to her feet. Adramal took a deep, shuddering breath. The stink of murder had returned. I need some fresh air, she said. Tagara followed her outside. Panting, she leaned against the house's front wall. Who is he? Was he? she asked. Other than Azerimuna, I were not sure yet, said Tagara. He's probably a trader. Most of them in Kair Altamar are. But their delegation hasn't reported anyone missing. That means he was probably an independent. My men are trying to find out which inn he was staying at. I should know by this time tomorrow. Adramal stared into the distance, wishing she could forget what she'd seen. How do you think he died, then? said Tagara. She turned to him. Isn't it obvious? I've seen men survive worse burns than that, he said. Does the fact it was done with magic make a difference? Maybe, she said. Would magic burn hotter than fire or cause more pain? She wasn't sure she wanted to know. How do you think it was made? All at once, like a stamp or a brand, or was it carved, maybe with a knife or a hot iron rod? The magic in the radiating lines was slightly stronger than that in the circle. In turn, the magic in the circle varied in strength along its circumference. Assuming the magic had all been at the same strength to begin with, that meant the circle had been drawn first and the lines later. I think it was carved, she said. That probably means he was already dead when it was done. Oh, said Adramel. How do you reckon that? It's very neat, said Tagara, and there are no gaps. If he'd still been alive, he would have struggled. Yes, said Adramel. I suppose he would. Mutilating the man when he was already dead seemed somehow worse than doing it to kill him. Did you find the hole in the world? I know now that you mention it. My spells seem to be working as well as they normally do. Had her teachers been wrong about that then? So what does that mean, said Tagara. The most obvious answer is that he was killed somewhere else. Exactly what I was thinking, he said. She blinked. What? Why didn't you tell me? I only suspect it, he said, wearily holding up a hand. Firstly, because there's no blood on the premises or any sign of a struggle. Secondly, because none of the neighbours saw or heard anything last night. Even so, said Adraman, why didn't you tell me? I wanted you to reach your own conclusions. If I'd said straight away, I think he wasn't killed here, you'd have thought, well, he's investigated murders before, he knows what he's talking about, it must be true. So I let you do your own thinking, reach a conclusion by roots I know nothing of. Even so, we've arrived in the same place. Doesn't that make it much more likely that we're right? She shrugged. I suppose so. Show a bit more enthusiasm, won't you? He said, forcing a smile. This is the sort of insight that will lead to catching the killer. The only enthusiasm I feel right now, she said with a yawn, is for my bed, even if it is too short for me. I should have mentioned she's really tired at this point because she's been using a lot of magic, which makes her tired. Mm. We won't keep you much longer then, he said. 
He said the only magic he saw was the spell that carved the symbol, and we think that didn't kill him. Do you have any thoughts on what did kill him? She was about to say no, and then remembered she hadn't really looked at the corpse as a corpse. Until now it had just been an unwitting carrier for that appalling mark. My skills in healing are meant for use on the living. She yawned again, but I'll see what I can find. She knelt beside the victim and placed her hands on his chest. She shuddered and almost pulled away. The chill of his skin removed any lingering hope. This man was dead and had been for some time. Apart from magic, what might kill a man without leaving a mark on him? Poison was an obvious possibility, a broken neck another. She was vaguely aware that poison came in many varieties, some quick, some slow. They had a wide range of symptoms and she couldn't hope to detect them all. When was he last seen alive, she asked. I don't know, said Tagara. My men are trying to find out. Was he telling the truth? Maybe it didn't matter. She cast the spell that sensed a person's bones and touched the victim's forehead. Her fingertips inched over his skull, finding the sutures where the individual bones had fused together during his childhood. No damage to his skull, she said, half to herself. She lifted the man's head and put her other hand under his neck. The vertebrae were intact and, as near as she could tell, in line with one another. I don't think his neck's broken, she muttered. Next, she checked his arms, finding nothing unusual, and his ribs. One was crooked and she guessed it had been broken and healed some years ago. The bones in his legs were intact too. She let go of the spell and crawled back to the man's head. She tried to relax. Her deep breaths brought the scent of death back to her. Have you finished, said Tagara. Almost, she said. One more spell. The spell was similar to the previous one, but looked deeper, allowing her to perceive the organs. She cradled his head. His brain was soft and squashy like an overripe fruit. The blood that had pooled at the back of his head made the brain slippery. She found nothing she could be sure was an injury. Though she, though she wondered how she would know, never having examined the brain of a living person. She moved on to the heart and lungs with which she was more familiar. These had been strong when he was alive and, as she was coming to expect, were uninjured. She moved her hand lower, wondering if she might be able to sense what his last meal had been. Pain shot through her as though boiling water had been thrown over her hand and forearm. She screamed and fell backwards, twisting her knees and banging her head on the floor. Andromal! shouted Tagara. Even as the pain faded, the symbol seemed to hang over her, growing steadily larger as if to devour her. Andromal! Tagara touched her shoulder and the symbol vanished. Are you all right? She gave a weak nod. What happened? It looked as if that mark on his stomach burnt your hand. Pretty much, she said. It doesn't hurt now, but I think the spell is trying to stop me from looking inside that part of him. She sat up. You reckon the spell is there to hide something, then? Possibly. It'd be worth having someone cut him open and see what's in there. Tagara gave an awkward smile. That wouldn't be advisable. The Zerimunai insist on a great deal of respect for the dead. To mutilate his body would be a terrible insult to his family, if not his whole tribe. We're going to have enough trouble with him being the way he is now. She looked out of the door. The street was mostly in shadow. Sunset isn't far away. I need to get home before I collapse. The wagon won't reach the village before it's dark. Adramel was about to say she could make enough light to show the way, and then realised she was in no state to do any such thing. I'll pay for you to stay at an inn, he said. Anywhere, she said, as long as it doesn't serve porridge for breakfast. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Wow. Editing. Is that the good. hardest part or the easiest part? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> some people find it hard, some people find it easy. So I ask myself who are the main characters? Um, the answer might not be who I thought it was at the start when I started writing. And what are the characters trying to accomplish? What's the story goal? Which, again, might not be what I thought it was when I started. Mm -hmm. And I make a scene-by-scene -scene outline, which is 
you know, a sentence or two about that says what happens in each scene or each chapter. And if I can't distill it down enough to write just one or two sentences about that scene, that means either it's too long or there's too much going on in it. So I need to break it down or I need to simplify it. And then if I'm using a, a structure like three act or the hero's journey, I look at the outline and see how well it matches. There's, there's actually software that you can use to um, take an outline like this and it will tell you how well it matches the, the ideal of um, the hero's journey where whether you've got all the turning points in, in the right places and in the right order and when, whether they're roughly where, they, where the outline says they need to be. Uh, you don't have to use that if you don't want to. I, I don't. Uh, and then ask yourself, or I ask myself, whether each of the scenes, each scene develops the characters, meaning allows them to grow as people or reveals more, more about them uh, that, that's interesting or relevant to the reader. Or are the characters making progress towards the story goal? Or have they had some massive obstacle thrown in their way that makes them move away from the story goal? Uh, and if the answer to both of those questions is no, then flag that scene to be either rewrite it so you can answer yes, or cut it. Mm. Uh, a lot of new writers, especially, tend to write too much rather than too little. Yeah, mm. they, they waffle, mm. and uh, mm. it's uh, you know, best best to say too little than, than too much. Uh, so you, this this process it can also work within a scene, looking at paragraphs and sentences. You know, each, each scene can have a, a goal. So, okay, so the the overall goal in Death and Magic is to catch the murderer, but in, when when they're examining a body, their their goal in that scene is to gain information from from the body and figure out how how the person died or whether there are any clues that might help them catch the murderer. So are, are they making progress towards that? And if they're not, then that's rewrite or cut. Uh, so there, there's basically two ways of, of publishing a book. Um, traditional publishing, which is what used to be called just publishing, uh, and self-publishing. And, and the difference essentially is who pays for it. So with traditional publishing, there's a, a company usually or a, an organisation that reviews everything that writers send to them and picks out the ones they think will be commercially successful and offers to publish those and publishes the ones where the author agrees and they pay for everything that needs to be done to take the book from the manuscript that the author submits to the point where it's on the shelves in a bookshop and readers can buy it. Uh, and because they're, they're basically investing in the book, that makes them very choosy about what they publish. Yeah. They, they might get a hundred manuscripts and publish one of them. Self-publishing is kind of turning that around where the, the author acts as the publisher. So the author pays for everything that the author thinks needs to be paid for. And so essentially, it's essentially impossible to fail at self-publishing. In, in that you will always end up with a published book at the end of it that people can buy if they want to, uh, unless you've written something that's actually illegal. <laughs> um, there's not much that's illegal to publish in this country. Uh, <clears throat> the problem then is is that Amazon has something like 10 million books for sale. Uh, how do you cut through the noise? Well, the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the answer nowadays is marketing, yeah. Yeah. which uh, I'm only just beginning to learn how to do. Yeah. Uh, there isn't one of these that's always right for everybody. You've got to look at the pros and cons and decide for yourself which, which one you want to try. Uh, if you want to, to try for traditional publishing, there's uh, a directory updated annually. It's called Writers and Artists Yearbook and that lists all of the publishers who operate in the UK mm. and all the literary agents. Literary agents are kind of gatekeepers for publishers now. 
so that publishers, rather than having some low-paid person on staff whose job is to read all the rubbish that comes in and find the one good manuscript out of the hundred, um, they have they rely on freelance agents who basically do the same thing. But because they the agents get paid commission when a book gets published, they they have an incentive to get good at picking out the good stuff the good, yeah. uh, and spotting future bestsellers before the book has actually gone to the market. And if they don't if, if they don't become good at that, they don't stay agents for very long. Uh, if you want to try for self publishing, there, there's lots of ways you can get your book onto the market. The two main ways are Amazon provides a, a platform or um, a service that's called KDP. It stands for Kindle Direct Publishing. Mm -hmm. You can do print books through it as well. Uh, there's also another company called Draft to Digital, which is basically an aggregator that gets you into everybody who isn't Amazon. Oh, really? And that, that saves you the, the bother of having to upload the same book to 10 or 20 or 50 different retailers and answer the same questions but in slightly different formats mm. and, and deal with, with all their, their different requirements. Uh, and it also saves you the bother of waiting for the money to come in because a lot of the smaller retailers have payment thresholds where they say they pay you every month but if they owe you less than a certain amount, they just hold on to it until yeah. the next month. Yeah. And the next month, and the next month, and the next month, until eventually <laughs> you have enough. <coughs> or you, you get fed up and say, right, I'm unpublishing my book, go away. <laughs> so any, any of those retailers that, that works with draft to digital they, they have hundreds or thousands of books that draft to digital have sent them. And so... Every month they send draft to digital a payment, one payment of you know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for all the books they've sold, and then draft to digital split it out among all the all, all of the authors who've submitted books to them. Okay. So you've got only one one payment coming in for the author every every month or every quarter. Um, <clears throat> You do have to be aware there are a lot of scammers out there. And I think this is mainly because writing and publishing, like, like any other kind of creative industry or creative business, there are far more people want to do it and get paid to do it than the market will support in, mm. in the way that it's currently structured. Yeah. Uh, and so that means that if you have no moral scruples, it's much easier to make money by fleecing authors than it is by trying to sell books to the, to the book reading public. And so, so are there issues with um, copyright and concerns about people stealing your ideas or stealing your books? And I think every every new writer worries about that, mm. and I don't think it, it it very rarely happens in the way that. Most people seem to think it would. Um, you're, um, unless you're making a lot of money from writing, your manuscript doesn't have very much commercial value. Mm, of course. It's not worth anybody's while to try and steal it. Mm. Uh, because they, they'd have the same problem that you have. How do you Still convince people to buy it? Um, yeah. um, publish it. Mm. Uh, and the added worry that they're selling something that doesn't belong to them, so you could come along and find them and set the lawyers on them. Uh, there, there's a lot of sites that, that claim to have pirate copies of millions of books. I suspect a lot of them are actually scams, scams. where they've, they've just downloaded the free sample of, of the book that you can get from Amazon without having to pay for it. Or they, they just have the, the title and the, the name, the author's name and the cover, uh, and you click to say, yeah, I want to read that. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, give us give us your credit card details and we'll we'll, we'll send the book over to you on it. was last words, yes. Yeah. We we won't we won't steal your credit card, honest. Uh, yeah. So I I don't worry about any of those sites. 
yeah, so a couple of warning signs, way, ways to spot scammers. It, it used to be really simple before self-publishing took off, so anybody who wanted you to pay them was a scammer. Mm -hmm. that, that was the end of it. Um, but now with self-publishing, you're the publisher, you invest in your book, so it can make sense to pay some people for some things. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a little bit, it's harder to explain without dragging in a lot of publishing terminology mm -hmm. that's kind of outside the scope of this talk. So I've, I've distilled it down to a couple of common warning signs. So the first, first one is if they contact you first without you contacting them, they're mm -hmm. almost certainly a scammer. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and if they if they claim to be a publisher or they talk about you receiving royalties, uh, but they want you to do something that will cost you money, yeah. and then they're a scammer and run yeah. away. Yeah. And I'm, I'm I'm careful to say something that costs you money rather than you pay them money because mm -hmm. sometimes they'll sometimes they'll they're upfront and they say yes, give us five thousand pounds and we'll publish your book and make you a bestseller. And, yeah. And, the audio, the audio. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes they're, they're a bit more subtle than that because the message about never pay to be published is getting through. So they'll, they'll say things like, oh, oh yes, it's free to publish with us, but we want you to buy 500 copies of your book to mm -hmm. uh, contribute towards <laughs> the costs. Uh, okay. Or if they claim to be a literary agent, they, they'll say, oh, oh yes, I'd, I'd be happy to represent your book and, and sell it to the all these big name publishers, but I think it would really benefit from having a professional edit first. And oh, by the way, yeah, I, I know this really great professional <laughs> editor who, who will give you a really good rate if you mention my name. He's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and by the way, I don't have a brother. He sounds very much like me on the phone. <laughs> so yeah, often the this professional they want you to go and talk to will just be kicking back money to them, and and sometimes it's just. The agent under another name. Different yeah. name, yeah. yeah. Uh, Scamming you again. Yeah. So that comes to yes. the sale, sales pitch. Dot net. That's where to find find my books. If you remember nothing else from tonight's talk, remember <laughs> that. Take a photo of it. Take, yeah. a, take a photo, <laughs> yes. I'll take a photo. <laughs> it's all in our heads. <laughs> all available. <laughs> So, yeah, they're available. The ebooks are available at all, all good ebook retailers. Oh, well, that's yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> that's and then, if you remember nothing else from this slide, remember the last line: pembers.net. Definitely, it's got links to everything. Yeah. It says a uh, very good website. Reading from you, reading to you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to do a with you? Thank you, Stephen. It is. It's, uh, <laughs> it's right now. <laughs>